Good morning, Calvary Chapel. Praise the Lord this morning. Amen. This beautiful summer's day. Praise God. The Holy Spirit says in Psalm 147, Praise the Lord, for it is good to sing praises to our God, for it is pleasant and praise is beautiful. He heals the brokenhearted and binds up their wounds. He counts the number of the stars. He calls them all by name. Great is our Lord and mighty in power. He under, his understanding is infinite. The Lord lifts up the, wimp, the humble. He casts the wicked down to the ground. Now, let everything that has breath praise the Lord. Please stand and let's worship the Lord together in one voice and one accord. The place where mercy reigns and never dies. There's a place where streams of grace go deep and wide. Where all the love I ever found. Comes like a flood, comes flowing down. At the cross, at the cross, I surrender my life. I'm in all of you, I'm in all of you, where your love ran red and my sin. a place where sin and grace are powerless, where my heart has peace with God and forgiveness, where all the Bow 
At the cross, at the cross, I surrender my life. I'm in all of you. I'm in all of you. Where your love ran red and my sin washed white, I owe all to you. I owe all to you. At the cross, at the cross, I surrender.
Don't stop dancing and dreaming. There's still good news worth believing. So take your head and keep singing. Praise the Lord. Good morning. Let us pray. Heavenly and gracious Father, we thank you. We thank you for the gift of today. For this is the day that you have made. We will rejoice and be glad in it. Lord, we thank you for your grace and tender mercies, which you pour upon us every morning, fresh and new. We thank you for your love. We thank you for your word. We thank you for your spirit. Holy Spirit, come do a mighty work in our hearts this morning. Now, Lord, we thank you for your church, all the ministries you let us participate in here. We ask a special blessing for our pastor as he gets ready to bring forth your word in the book of Revelation. And Lord, we never want to forget what you did for us on the cross. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Take a minute and greet each other in the name of the Lord. All right, if you take your seats for a couple minutes, we have uh, several announcements. Just a little housekeeping. Um, those little rectangles, uh, shut them off, please. Uh, turn off the volume. Uh, we just don't want the word of God interrupted when the pastor gets teaching in the book of Revelation. Also, coffee, please finish it in the cafe before you step into the sanctuary. It's a little difficult to clean it up if it does happen to spill. Okay, uh, right now through October, uh, we have two services every Sunday, 8.30 and 10.30. Every morning, children's ministry is at the end of the hallway. Uh, six o'clock, we're right back here for corporate prayer. We like to call it family prayer. Tomorrow, ladies, your breakfast at the Castaways is at 8.30 in the morning. And then after breakfast right here, uh, 9.30 is crocheting and the word. And then 7 p.m. is our Freedom Through Christ Addiction Ministry with Pastor Mark and his wife, Rini, teaching that. Wednesday night is our midweek study. Uh, we have a time of worship, then we go through the Bible, then we have prayer, and then a little fellowship afterwards. And also, children's program and nursery are provided for that also. Thursday morning, men meet around the corner at the airport at the Flight Deck restaurant for breakfast this week. And then 10:15 right here, we have a devotional on Facebook and YouTube. Friday morning, morning men meet at the end of the hallway uh, currently in uh, our study in Acts, Bill Salvia is teaching back there. And then 10 o'clock, women meet in prayer at 11 South 7th Street in Del Haven. 11 o'clock, uh, we have a devotional also on Friday morning on Facebook and YouTube on Friday and Thursday. Okay, our upcoming events. If you happen to be handed or picked up a bulletin, uh, you'll see there is a change uh, for those that don't know. Our coffee house has been changed to Friday the 30th of July at 7 p.m. Uh, to share our musical talents with those that uh, have given their name to the pastor to be put on the list. If you haven't yet and you want to share, uh, see the pastor uh, anytime during the day or the service afterwards. And then very important, August 29th is our date for baptisms on the beach. If anyone knows someone that needs to be baptized, uh, pastor would be glad to dunk you and sometimes he even puts you under twice <laughs> thanks thanks carl praise the lord gang please stand and let's continue worshiping the lord in one voice in one accord and if you're too tired to stand or you can't stand god hears your beautiful heart right where you are amen I love you, Lord. Oh, your mercy never fails me. All my days I've been held in your hand. From the moment that I wake up, 
Until I lay my head, I will sing of the goodness of God. All my life you have been faithful. The goodness of oh God. Beautiful, ain't it? I love your voice. You have led me through the fire in darkest night. You are close like no other. I've known you as a father. I've known you as a friend. In the goodness of God All my life you have been faithful All my life you have been so, so good With every breath that I am able I will sing of the goodness God. Come on, church, let me hear you. Your goodness is running out. It's running out to me. Your goodness is running out. Running out to me. I'm not laid down. I'm surrendering now. I'll give you everything. Your goodness is running out. Running out to me. Your goodness is running after, running after me. Your goodness is running after, running after me. My life's laid down, I'm surrendering now. I give you everything. Your goodness is running after, running after me. Come on, church, join me. The light from getting through. We do. do you wish you could see it all made new? We do. Don't 
all creation groaning. Is the new creation coming? Is the glory of the Lord to be the light within our midst? Is it good that we remind ourselves of this? Is anyone worthy? Is anyone whole? Is anyone able to break the seal and open the scroll? The light Father truly love us. He does. does the Spirit move among us? He does. And does he Jesus our Messiah hold forever, forever those he loves? He does. does our God intend to dwell again with us? Is anyone worthy? Is anyone whole? Is anyone able to break the seal and open the scroll? The Lion of Judah, who conquered the grave. He is David's root and the Lamb who died to ransom the slave. From every people and tribe. Every nation and tongue He has made us a kingdom of priests to God To reign with His Son Is He worthy? Is He worthy? Of all blessing and honor and glory Is He worthy? Is He worthy? Lord, you alone are worthy of all praise. You alone are worthy of all honor. Lord, you're so worthy, Lord. And we thank you, Lord, from the bottom of our hearts, Lord. As we gaze into your holiness, as we gaze into your loveliness, we see things that just fade away around us, Lord, and all there is is you. Oh, Lord, you're so worthy. You have made yourself worthy by going to a cross You've made yourself worthy by being the Son of God. You've made yourself worthy by coming to earth. And the Father has declared you worthy. And oh, Lord, you are so worthy. And oh, how we love you, Lord. How we love you, Lord. You are the great I am, the great, wonderful Lord, Savior, Lion of Judah, the Lamb that was slain. Oh, Lord, you are all those things and so, so much more. You are so worthy, Lord, and we love you, and we thank you, Lord. And it's in your name, Jesus, that we pray. Amen. Amen. Morning. You may be seated. 
It's a shame they didn't like the worship. I heard you singing back there. You guys sounded great. That was wonderful. I heard you singing. That's good. All right. Well, welcome. It's nice to see all of you here this beautiful, beautiful morning. I um, want to remind you what Carl reminded you that a couple things. Number one is that we do our baptisms on the beach on the 29th of August at the concrete ship down at Sunset Beach. And as Carl said, um, sometimes I have to dunk you twice, depending upon who you are. And some people I've held under a little longer than necessary, but, you know, it's just, I want to make sure. But, uh, no, if you have never been baptized, maybe you were baptized as an infant, or maybe you want to be baptized, or maybe the Lord is really push, pushing upon your heart that you would love to be baptized and show the witness of Jesus Christ in your life. It is a great witness because I guarantee a crowd of people will look on. It's a great time. So let me know, and we'll put you on the list and put you in the water and let you be baptized. That'd be a fun thing. I'd be honored to be the one who leads you to baptism. So, Wednesday night is our Through the Bible night, and we are studying God's Word line by line, verse upon verse. Come on out for a time of fellowship at 7 o'clock, and then um, great worship and study of God's Word and prayer and all those wonderful things that accompany that. So, it's a lot of fun. This morning, we are continuing through the churches in the book of the Revelation of Jesus Christ. So, if you have your Bibles, we are starting a new chapter. We're starting chapter 3 this morning. So if you have your Bibles, turn to chapter 3. We'll be looking at verses 1 through 6. If you need a Bible, we'll get you a Bible. Raise your hand. We'll put a Bible into your hand so you can follow along with us if you'd like. And if not, turn to the Revelation of Jesus Christ, chapter 3. Chapter 3, verses 1 through 6. All right. So, if you found your way, let me read aloud as you read along silently, please. And to the angel of the church in Sardis, write, These things says he who has the seven spirits of God and the seven stars. I know your works, that you have a name, that you are alive, but you are dead. Be watchful and strengthen the things which remain that are ready to die. For I have not found your works perfect before God. Remember, therefore, how you have received and heard. Hold fast and repent. Therefore, if you will not watch, I will come upon you as a thief, and you will not know what hour I will come upon you. You have a few names, even in Sardis, who have not defiled their garments, and they shall walk with me in white, for they are worthy. He who overcomes shall be clothed in white garments, and I will not blot out his name from the book of life. But I will confess his name before my father and before his angels. He was an ear that I'm here what the Spirit says to the church. Shall we pray? Father, Lord, it is always a blessing to stand before you and worship you in spirit and truth. It's always a blessing to sing praises to your name. Because as we just sang, you are so worthy. And Lord, we love singing these praises to you. And as we sing, Lord, our hearts are overwhelmed. Our hearts are joyful. Our hearts are peaceful. And we feel your presence by your spirit moving in, through, and upon us. Now, Lord, I ask, Lord, that you would help to settle our hearts, that we might sit before you as you expound on your word today through your spirit, that your spirit would touch our hearts in such a way that we would take the words that are written here the words that are explained here, and we would put them into our hearts and we would act upon them. That, Lord, there is something here that you want us to know, something here for each of us, something that you've prescribed through your word. And we know, Lord, that you're not slacking your promises because your word will accomplish all that you've sent it today. It will accomplish everything that you have on your agenda, Lord. We know that it's your will that all would come to the knowledge of Jesus Christ, of Jesus Christ by coming to repentance. So, Father, thank you for this time we have. And Lord, we know we'll be blessed. We know, Lord, that you are a blessing, God, who continues to pour your love out upon us. So, Lord, thank you for this time. Blessed be your name. In the great name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. Amen. Okay, so, have you noticed lately that in the last few years, the entertainment industry has been fascinated with zombies? Yeah, come on, Night of the Living Dead, I Am Legend, Dawn of the Dead, 28 Days Later, Zombieland, and Zombieland 2, come on. The list goes on and on and on and on. 
There are so many zombie movies and TV shows about zombies out there, I've lost count. In fact, I tried to count all of the zombie movies that came out since the year 2000. And I started, and they were listed alphabetically. I got to L, and there was around 200, and I stopped at the letter L. So you can imagine. Never heard of a zombie? Well, let me enlighten you. A zombie is a fictitious creature or a monster who is out from being a human being that has died and some way, some way has become reanimated. And his sole purpose now is to go out and kill others and make them zombies. See, the zombies are not truly alive. Instead, like the AMC hit TV show says, they're the walking dead. Now, some of you are probably scratching your head and looking for the exit sign, thinking your pastor has completely lost his rocker. Why are you talking about zombies? We're supposed to be talking about the revelation of Jesus Christ. How does this relate? As we come this morning, we begin a new chapter. We come to the fifth letter of seven that John is writing to the churches in Asia. John is recording Jesus' words here, and he has been instructed to write these words and then send them out, and that is exactly what he is doing. We've already looked at four churches, and today we look at the church of Sardis. The church of Sardis once had a great reputation. At one time, people looked at this church, and they saw an active a strong and an alive church. People talked about the church. They admired the church. They all wanted to be a part of this church. Yes, the church had a reputation. Yes, they had made a name for themselves in the community. But that's all they had, a reputation and a name. See, the problem was Sardis was resting on their traditions. They were living on their laurels, their past glories. They weren't resting in their relationship with Jesus Christ, and they weren't pressing onward. They had become stagnant. And although the church was alive from an outward perspective, it was dead. And now Jesus is basically calling the church spiritual zombies. They're walking dead. You have a name. You're alive, but you're dead. As we begin this letter, it begins the same way the other four letters did. Look at verse 1a. And to the angel of the church in Sardis write. So Jesus is telling John once again, he opens the letter by writing to the angel of the church. Now we have talked about this at length. Could be the pastor, could be an elder, it could be the leadership, or could be actual guardian angel who was sent to guard over the church. We're not 100% sure, but it's to everyone. It's to the church. This letter is supposed to be read to the church. So it's not only directed to the leadership, it's addressed to the entire church. And it's important that we look at the church. And we've been going through some serious, serious things, guys. We've had some really hard talks in the last four letters. There's been some difficult scriptures that we've had to go through. But there's a reason for this. And as I told first service, everybody, when you see the book of Revelation, wants to get to what they call the good stuff. The bold judgments and the woes and this and that and the other. Well, you got to get through this stuff to get to that stuff. And there's a lot of things in here that we need to look at. And, you know, if you look at these seven churches, there is something about us in every seven church. And we need to look at ourselves. We need to look at ourselves. The letter is written to the church at Sardis. Sardis was a commercial and industrial city. It sat at the junction of five rows. It was a perfect location. It was called the ancient city of Lydia at one time, and it seems that the greatness of the city had long passed by. And during the 6th century BC, it was one of the greatest cities in the world. It was ruled by King Croesus, whom the Greeks called Midas because of his great treasuries of gold. Sadly, the church had been captured many times in spite of the fact that it was a high citadel, a fortress that sat on top of a very steep cliff, and they thought it to be impenetrable. It wasn't. 
In 546 BC, King Croesus was dethroned, and the city became the capital of Persian, of the Persian Empire, excuse me. In 499 BC, the city was destroyed by the Greeks. And in 334 BC, the city actually surrendered to Alexander the Great without even a battle. Finally, in the year 17 AD, the city was destroyed by an earthquake. But the Roman Caesar Tiberius rebuilt the city. And this is the city under Roman rule that John is now writing this letter to. This is that city. And much like the history of the city, the church in Sardis was in constant danger. And what was once a great church, a church that flourished, a church that was alive, deteriorated and seemed to be asleep. In verse 1b, Jesus introduces himself like he did in the other four letters. These things says he who has the seven spirits of God and the seven stars. These things says he who has the seven spirits of God. Now we know there's only one Holy Spirit, but remember, Revelation is all about symbols and numbers and things. Seven means completeness, means perfection. It demonstrates completeness of the Holy Spirit. Jesus is complete. He has the complete Holy Spirit. And if you look back in Isaiah, it lists the sevenfold manifestations of the Spirit that Jesus has. He has all of it. Nothing is missing from him. Why did Jesus introduce himself this way? Well, I think he introduced himself this way to give the church hope. Hope of a new life. See, Jesus is the head of the church, and only he can bring life back to the church through his Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit gives life to a church. I can prove this in the Gospel of John, and we just went through this a while back. In the Gospel of John, in chapter 6, in verse 63, this is what it says, Jesus speaking. It is the Spirit who gives life. The flesh profits nothing. The words that I speak to you are spirit and they are life. The Holy Spirit is what gives the church life. And that's what Sardis needed. They needed a new life. All the church programs that they had could never bring life. All the committees that they had, all the things, all the tradition, all the rituals that they went through can never bring a church back from a deep sleep. Remember? Back on the day of Pentecost, as recorded in Acts 1 and 2, on the day of Pentecost, the Holy Spirit gave birth to the church. The Holy Spirit fell upon the 120 believers in the upper room, and the church was born. It's the Spirit that did that. The Spirit gave them new spiritual life. When the Holy Spirit is grieved, when the Holy Spirit is quenched, when the Holy Spirit is ignored, the church begins to lose life, and it begins to lose power. However, when sin is confessed by the members of the church, they not only get right with God, but they get right with each other. Then the Spirit begins to pump new life into the church. The Spirit begins to pump new life into the church. Boom. And the church becomes alive because it becomes trusting in the Spirit and knowing that the Spirit is leading and guiding. It's the Spirit doing the work, not man. And then revival takes place. Something we all want, right? Something we all think we need. Also, notice that, that the Lord holds and controls the seven stars. Now, he previously told us in chapter 1 that the seven stars were the messengers or the angels of the churches. Jesus holds them. He's upholding them. He's lifting them up. I get the feeling, though, that he's holding them responsible for the church's life. He's holding them responsible for the church. Yeah, it's a heavy burden that the Lord puts upon us. He's holding them responsible. Are they teaching the word of God? Are they teaching it correctly? Are they giving credence to the gospel? Are people becoming saved? Is there new life being formed in the church itself? Are people growing in the grace and the knowledge? This all falls on the leadership. It falls on the pastor. So Jesus is holding him responsible. But he's also holding the congregation responsible the entire congregation, because Jesus has the fullness, the seven stars. He has the fullness of the church in his hands. He has the fullness of the church in his hands. And look what he says in verse 
3, 1c. I know your works, that you have a name, that you're alive, and you are dead. As all the churches that we've studied, the Lord says, I know your deeds. I see your works. So once again, as we've looked at it in the last four churches, the Lord's x-ray vision now is at work. That which is invisible to men is clearly seen by the Lord. The Lord knows because why? He looks upon the heart of man. The Lord looks upon your heart, and he's looking now, regardless of how spiritual you may think you are. No matter how spiritual I may think I am, the Lord is always looking into my heart. He's always seeing me. Remember what he's doing? We talked about this. He's holding a mirror up, and he's saying, Dave, look in that mirror. I'm going to show you things that you might need to get rid of. Show you things that you might need to repent of. Show you things that are a little concerning to me. He's doing the same thing to the church through these letters. That's what he's doing. Look at yourselves. Examine yourselves. The Lord always reveals our true condition, regardless of how spiritual we may think we are. The Lord knows. I've said many, many, many times, you can fool me. You can't fool the Lord. <laughs> you can't fool the Lord. How does he do it? He uses his word. He uses the conviction of the Holy Spirit. And he holds that mirror up. He says, what are we lacking? What am I doing? And it's up to us to go to him and say, Lord, search me, try me, show me. Notice that he says, I know your deeds. There is no specific condemnation like in the other four letters. There are no doctrinal problems. There is no correction needed there. There was no persecution. It's not even mentioned. The church was alive. It had a name, but it was dead. Excuse me. It's described as dead. It appeared to be alive. It had a reputation of being alive. It looked spiritually vibrant from the outside, but it was lifeless inside. They were spiritual zombies. They were spiritual zombies. The church was Christian in name only. Outwardly, darling, you look marvelous. Outwardly. One of my favorite woes is in Matthew 23, verse 27. You know, Jesus gives these woe to the scribes and Pharisees. And there's a whole list of them. You can read through Matthew 23. I love it. When Jesus really calls the Pharisees on the carpet. But in Matthew 23, 27, Jesus gives them the scathing rebuke. He says, basically paraphrasing, you look great on the outside, but inside you're full of dead man bones. He calls them whitewashed sepulchers. Whitewashed sepulchers. Because at, before of every feast, before every feast, they used to get out there and they used to whitewash all the tombs. So they would look good on the outside. But inside were dead man bones. He was accusing the Pharisees of being very that very thing. Whitewashed sepulchers. Well, Church of Sardis was active and strong. It was Christ honoring. But that was a distant memory. Everything the church was known for had vanished away or was vanishing away. Maybe they had grown too comfortable. Maybe they were living off their past victories. Yeah, I remember a time when we did this. Weren't we great? Maybe they were steeped in tradition and rituals. They still had a name Christian. They still had a reputation of being alive, but in reality, they were dead. Life was gone. There was no life in the church. And it's important to consider a couple points here. Reputation simply means what others thought of the church. They appeared to be alive means what others see, but they were really dead. That's what's not seen. Someone looks into the church and goes, wow, they got it going there. Look at that. Look at all the things they're involved in. Look at all the stuff they're doing. Outside, you look great. But what's in here? What's inside? This is what Jesus is saying. The point is that they had a reputation. They were known far and wide for being active. They were filled with activity, action, and programs. A lot of churches today are filled just like that. Filled with all sorts of programs and actions. I'm not coming down on programs. I'm not coming down on those as such. But what's inside? What's happening? And by the world's standards, this church looked fantastic. They were successful. And everyone was proud of their church. Can you imagine when they heard the Lord's words? Ah, you're dead. Paul understood this. And as he's writing to his beloved son in the faith, Timothy, in 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 5, he described Christians in saying they had a form of godliness, 
But because of their failure to walk with the Lord, they were denying the real power of God through their hypocrisy. They were out of touch of the elements and true spirituality. Some of them might have been professing Christians, Christians, but they were engaged in religious activities. And they never really trusted in Jesus Christ. This is what's happening here. This could be happening here. It's very, very scary. And more than likely, however, these people were carnal believers. They had a good start, but they failed to make the cut. They failed to make the finish. They didn't move on. They didn't grow. They didn't experience true spirituality. They were engaged in works and active. But temporarily, they were dead. Why? Because they were out of fellowship with Jesus Christ. They were out of fellowship. You want to be dead? Go out of fellowship with Jesus Christ. Get out of fellowship with him. Sadly, the church was ignoring their decay. Oh, we look great. People love us. We're doing great. We don't have to worry about that. And even what was left was about to die. See, when a church begins to worship its own past or its own history, when a church begins to worship its reputation or its name, or the names of people sitting in the church, oh, yeah, this guy, I know him. Oh, yeah, he's, there. he's great. Oh, that guy. oh, wow, he's wonderful. The church begins to die. The church begins to die. Jesus, well, you know our Jesus. He doesn't miss words. He gives them a stern warning. Look at verse 2. Be watchful and strengthen the things which remain that are ready to die. For I have not found your works perfect before God. Be watchful. In other words, wake up. Wake up. You cannot be watchful if you're asleep. Every city had huge towers around it. And every night and every day, men would go up there and they would stand guard. And they were the watchmen. And they would stand on the towers and they would look and they would scour the countryside, looking for anyone who might come to invade the city. And if they saw somebody, they would sound the alarm. And that's what they were doing. They were looking for invaders. Jesus says, wake up. You guys are asleep. You can't guard the city if you're asleep. You can't guard the church if you're asleep. You can't do it. He gave this jolting command, wake up. He's doing this to encourage the church to take action. And as he's doing this to take action, it excites me because he's saying, there's still hope. There's still hope. There, there's still some time, guys. The members were to strengthen what little remained. They were to strengthen it, and they were to obey Jesus' word and repent. Notice the term, the things which remain. When people stop operating from the base of God's word, when people stop operating from the power of his Holy Spirit, spiritual decline begins. It's a kind of law of spiritual degeneration, I heard. Even in such a state, there is a first sometimes semblance of man's life, good habits, good traditions, good actions, good remembrance of morality. Even though people forgot the source, they're still trying to do good things. They are good-willed people, but they're missing the boat. For some reason, those who were watching in Sardis were asleep. Jesus says, strengthen that which remains. There are some good things remaining. Let's find out what they are, and let's strengthen them. Let's get on our going. Come on, guys. And it's interesting to me that as I studied the name Sardis, I found three meanings for the name Sardis. So it's pretty interesting when you look at what we're studying. The first thing, meaning is remaining. The second meaning is escaping. And the third meaning is prince of joy. Well, I sat about that and thought about it. I put it all together and I find this interesting because as we go on further, there were some remaining in Sardis, a remnant of believers, and Jesus warns them that they can escape judgment. And because they become children of God, they could be prince and princesses of great joy. So that is pretty cool when I look at that. And also, as I'm reading this, I'm reminded of what Paul wrote to the Roman church. And we've looked at this several times lately, and it's worth reading again. Paul writes this to the Roman church in, verse, in chapter 13, verses 11 through 14. He says this, And do this, knowing the time that is high time to awake out of sleep. For now our salvation is nearer than when we first believed. The night is far spent. The day is at hand. Therefore, let us cast off the works of darkness, and let us put on the armor of light. Let us walk properly as in the day, not in revelry or drunkenness, not in lewdness and lust, not in strife and envy, but put on the Lord Jesus Christ. Make no provision of the flesh to fulfill its lusts. 
That's what's happening here. The first step to any revival, the first step to any renewal in a church that is dying is to realize, hey, guys, something's wrong. Something's wrong. We need to be honest with ourselves. This means open ourselves up to Jesus' x-ray vision eyes and saying, all right, Lord, examine my heart. All right, Lord, show me, guide me by your Holy Spirit, point it out to me, and then help me repent of it. Help me to get rid of it so that I can move on. You know, it's like any organization or organism that is alive that shows growth. Any organism that's alive repairs that which is damaged, and then it reproduces. There's power associated with this very process, and the power of the church is the Holy Spirit. That is where we get our power, through the Holy Spirit. But if these elements are not visible, or if they're lacking in any way, the church is either dying or dead. It's not just up to the pastor. It's up to each individual in the church because we are the body of Christ. He is the head. And we are his body. And in order for us to go along cohesively and in union and be of like mind and have unity, we need to examine our own hearts. I can't examine your hearts because I can't see in them. But Jesus can. I can only examine my own heart and let the Lord show me. So it's up to the church to do that because we are his members of his body. No one ever wants to hear Jesus say, your works aren't perfect before God. Their works weren't perfect. Why? Because they were doing them with the wrong motivation. They were doing it with the wrong motivation. Their hearts were not right before God. They became works. We got to do this. Oh, we got to do this. They weren't thinking about God. This does tell us that though the spiritual condition of the church was bad, praise God, it was not hopeless. I love that. It was not hopeless. Spiritually, there were things that remained that could be straightened. Jesus hadn't given up on them. It hadn't been too late. Although they were ready to die, it wasn't too late. And you know, I love this about our Savior. I love this about my Jesus who always is there to give me hope, always there to give me a second, third, fourth, fifth, 110, 115, 512 chances. He's always there, always there. He never gives up on us, never gives up on us. Jesus says, remember, watch. In verse 3, though, he says, remember, therefore, how you have received and heard, hold fast, and repent. He gives them the key. You want to make it right? You want to bring the Spirit back in? You want things to go on? This is what I want you to do. Remember, remember how you received and heard. Hold fast and repent. Yes, Jesus uses the R word again. Repent. Repent. What they must do is remember how they first received and heard the Word of God. They must hold fast to those things and repent. They must restore the gospel and the apostolic authority that was overseeing the church and their lives. Paul described this in his letter to the Thessalonians in 1 Thessalonians 2, verse 13. He described what it means to receive the word of God this way. Listen to what he says. In 1 Thessalonians 2, verse 13, he said, For this reason, we also thank God without ceasing, because when you received the word of God, which you heard from us, you welcomed it, not as the word of men, but as it is in truth, the word of God, which also effectively works in you who believe. Remember when you received the word of God? Oh, yes. It became clear. It became exciting. You heard the word of God. You received it, and you felt new life in your body. You went, yes, this is what I want. This is what I need. He's saying, hold fast to that. Hold fast to that. And if anything's wrong, repent of it. And in this very small sentence, there is a formula for revival. Listen to the word that Jesus is speaking to your hearts this morning, what he's speaking to all of us this morning. Listen to what he's saying to all the churches. Listen to what he's saying to his sheep as he calls out your name. Wake up and be watchful. Strengthen yourself with, by remembering the word you've been received. Obey, repent, and hold fast. Be steadfast and immovable. This is what Jesus is saying. Check out the things that are wrong, correct them by the word of God, and move forward. Don't lay around and wait. Move forward. Now, 
remember, these are stern letters. And Jesus says, therefore, if you do not watch, therefore, if you do not watch, I will come upon you as a thief, and you will not know what hour I come upon you. So here comes the promise. It's not a threat. It's a promise. Jesus is returning. He is coming back. He warns them, your failure to watch, your failure to remember, your failure to repent and obey, okay, but remember, I'm coming back. I am returning. If we ignore his command to be watchful, he's going to sneak up on us on a time we don't expect. Now, I know that nobody knows the hour. I know that nobody knows the time, and it's ridiculous for us to try to say he's coming at such and such a time. But this is a sure promise that he will come back. This could have easily happened when he was writing this letter, but it didn't. We also know that time is drawing ever close, minute by minute, hour by hour. All you have to do is read a newspaper. All you have to do is look at what's happening around the world. All you have to do is look at what's happening in Israel, and you know time is heading fast. The age of grace is fastly dissipating. The age of grace. Remember, again, in Thessalonians, Paul speaking to the church in Thessalonica, he says this in chapter 5, in verse 2, he says, For you yourselves know perfectly that the day of the Lord so comes as a thief in the night. And in verse 4, he says, But you, brethren, are not in darkness, so that this day should overtake you as a thief. He's saying, You know. And if you're watching, you'll know. And if you're watching, and if you're doing the things I've told you to do, if you're watching and being steadfast, and you're repenting, and you're obeying God's word, and you're letting the Spirit wash over you, you'll know. It won't come upon you as a thief. You know, one of the fattest things I think a Christian could think about is being engaged in some Christ-dishonoring activity at the moment he returns. It's a horrible thought. What a horrible thought for me. Christians who are in churches that are dead or close to death must not only awaken to the truth of Jesus' soon return, but they also have to look back into the time when they were born again, a time when they truly received Jesus into their heart and heard the voice of his calling. And knowing these truths as Christians, we must hold fast and must repent of any spiritual deficiency we have. Jesus says, I'm going to come as a thief. I'm not going to come as a thief. It's interesting that in the Gospel of Luke, I didn't tag it again, so i got to turn to it. You might think after first service I would tag it. In chapter 22 of the Gospel of Luke, Luke writes these in interesting words of Jesus. In chapter 22, in verse 52, in the Gospel of Luke, it says, then Jesus said to the chief priests, captains of the temple, and the elders who had come to him, they were coming to get him, have you come out as against a robber with swords and clubs? We well, see what's happening here. The Lord, our Savior, is preparing to go to the cross. He's going to cross for you and for me. He's going to die for our sin. And these religious leaders and his whole mob come to arrest them. And he's, he's hurt by their actions, even though he knows it's going to happen. And he asks them, why are you coming me treating this way? Am I a thief? Am I a thief? See, the first time the Lord Jesus came, he came as the Lamb of God, suffering to take away our sins. But when he comes back, he'll come back as the roaring lion of Judah. He'll come back the second time. He's going to kick butt and take names. He will come back the second time. And these people thought and treated him like a thief. He says this in Revelation 16. In Revelation 16, 15, we'll get to that someday. Behold, I am coming as a thief. Blessed is he who watches and keeps his garments, lest he walk naked and they see his shame. I, I love the fact that Jesus acknowledges that there's some people who are still believing. See, Jesus knows he knows who's believing and who's posing. He knows what's going on in your heart. Look at verse 4. You have a few names, even in Sardis, who have not defiled their garments, and they shall walk with me in white, for they are worthy. You have a few there. Not everyone was asleep. Not everyone was asleep. And it kind of reminds me of when Elijah, 
Elijah's in a cave running from Jezebel. Elijah's in a cave running from a girl, and he's crying and weeping. Lord, they're going to get me, and I'm all by myself, and I don't know what to do. Lord says, what's wrong with you? I got 7,000 other guys who haven't bowed to Baal. What's wrong with you? It reminds me the same way. God always has a remnant. He always has a remnant available. He always has those with true hearts and true believing. He's always ready to rock and roll. There was a remnant of dedicated people in Sardis who still believed and existed, even though others were dead. They had some feeble life. Yeah, they were struggling, and they were working, and even though their works were lacking, they were still trying to do what the Lord wanted them to do. And these were the ones who the Lord said, strengthen them. Get those who remain and strengthen them. These are the Lord says, wake them up. Let them know that the end is near. This is encouragement. He says, continue on. Don't grow weary of doing good. Continue on. Continue on. And I'm encouraged by the fact that the Lord will take that which is given to him and use it for his glory. You give him this much, he'll take it. And he'll use it for his glory. Here we are. We have the life is weak and feeble. But there's always hope. There's always hope in Jesus Christ. And if you learn anything today, learn that there's always hope in Jesus. There is always hope. He promised that the pure ones, those who weren't defiled, those whose garments weren't soiled, would walk with him. What a picture of fellowship. What a picture of close-knit fellowship, walking with Jesus. Isn't that what we all want to do? These remain faithful, won't give up. They will walk with the Lord in garments of white, for they have been cleansed by the blood of the Lamb. Jesus then calls them astonishingly worthy. Oh, my goodness. Jesus calls them worthy. Wouldn't you love to hear that Jesus call you worthy? Worthy? Oh, Lord, I am so unworthy. I am so tragically unworried. No, no, no. In me, you are worthy. In me, you are worthy. Oh, my goodness. Wow. White garments are mentioned five other times in the book of Revelation. The church at Laodicea needs to hide their shame through white garment. Twenty-four elders wear white garment. The martyrs waiting for God's judgment are given white robes. The armies appearing with the Messiah wear white and clean linen. The great multitude that is saved in Revelation 7 wear robes of white that have been cleansed by the blood of the Lamb. This implies that the color white stands for God's people who are made spiritually pure and who are justified through the Lord Jesus Christ and through faith in him. Walking with Christ in white is a reward for their faithfulness. It means that a few in Sardis who were given the white robes have been right and just before God. We shouldn't lose sight of one thing, that the robes were given to them as a gift. It reflects that we don't justify ourselves by our good works. In of myself, my good works are like filthy rags. I'm only justified by faith in Jesus Christ. We are made spiritually right by the work of Jesus on the cross. No other way. I can't get there any other way. Jesus concludes his letter in verses 5 and 6. He says, He who overcomes shall be clothed in white garments. And I will not blot his name from the book of life, but I will confess his name before my Father and before his angels. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. Jesus identified these overcomers with the, those few names that have not defiled their garment. These overcomers will wear white garments, which will be received by Jesus. And I said this first service, and it's not biblical, but I didn't say it. But to me, the robe of righteousness is a white garment. And when the prodigal son was returning home, if you remember, the father put the royal robe on him. And I'm thinking maybe it was a robe of white. I don't know. It doesn't say truly. We can't be dogmatic about it. But think about it. It's got to be a robe of righteousness because he came home. He once was lost, and now he's found. And he put that robe on. I don't know. It's just maybe it's me. The white gar garment symbolizes righteousness and justice. Jesus explained the absolute necessity of being clothed by God with this garment of righteousness. Now, we need to look at the context of Revelation 3, 5 about the names in the book. I want you to focus on assurance so we do not think the names are constantly being erased and then rewritten and then erased and then rewritten and then erased and rewritten. That's not really how it goes. The focus here is not the idea that Jesus sits in heaven with a busy eraser. We should be careful, consider what it does say about the book of life. 
the word of God is quite clear about the book of life. So it's important. And you know what? I took what Guzik said here, and I'm just going to read a couple passages here. He said, there is a book of life, and it'll be open on the reference to the day of judgment. This means the book of life is real, and it will be read. There is a book of life, and it determines if we go to heaven or hell. The book of life is important. There is a book of life, and knowing our names are written in it should bring us great joy. Remember when the disciples came back from being sent out by Jesus? They were chucking and jiving and high-fiving. Woo! Cast out demons. We did this. We did that. Jesus said, whoa! Don't get all excited because you cast out demons. Don't get all excited because you healed the sick. But rejoice because your names are written in the Lamb's book of life. So it's rejoicing here. The book of life and knowing our names are written there brings us joy. There is a book of life. And it's referenced five times about people being blotted out. This means the idea of being blotted out of the book of life should be taken seriously. Perhaps it's only a symbol. The person's name was never there to begin with. I don't know. It's a mystery to me. I'm trying to understand it. I believe it's a time for assurance. My name isn't going to be blotted out if I continue to abide in Jesus Christ. I don't have to worry about that kind of stuff if I abide in Christ. If I don't abide in Christ, I'm always out there going, uh-oh. That's the time I start thinking about it. But if you abide in Christ, you don't have to worry about those kind of things. It's a metaphor for salvation and eternal life. And finally, Jesus promised that the name, the overcomer, he will call him before his father. And I love that. Matthew 10, verse 32, Jesus said, Whoever acknowledged me is before men, I will always acknowledge him before my father in heaven. Oh, man, when we arrive in glory... And our lives will be visible to everyone because there's nothing hidden. Jesus says, whatever you've done in secret will be shouted from the rooftops. Everything is open wide. What a beautiful time. No aspect of life can be hidden. Knowing that, many of us are awful afraid to appear in, in glory. We know the truth about ourselves. I know what I've done. I can hide them from you, but I know what I've done. But Jesus is going to show it loud and clear. It's not even going to be on a 60-foot screen. It'll probably be on a screen so big that everybody will see it. Think about that. But Jesus says, when you stand there, your entire life will be exposed for everybody to say, but I will look at you and say, you are mine. When everybody sees the horrible things you've done, when everybody sees the things that you did, that were, Jesus is going to say, no, no, they are mine. They belong to me. They belong to me. This sinner, this deviled person, this unworthy character, I want to shout to the universe that he is mine. And that's what he promises us. Why? Because he believed in the cross. He believed what I did on the cross was for him. He took it personally, and he is mine, and nothing can compare him. Jesus says, he who has an ear, let him hear that. Let him hear when Jesus calls their name. Open up your ears to the warnings of spiritual death. What are the characteristics of a dead church as we wrap up? The church becomes a focus and not salvation. The gospel dies. There's a disconnect between the appearance and reality. There's spiritual stupor. It's not being aware of your condition. The gospel doesn't happen. The works are not complete. There's a movement towards us, and that's the normal. Everybody's okay with it. There's no movement towards life. There's a spiritual hardness. Many unbelievers in the church, they have soiled garments, and they will refuse to repent. And what are the threats of a dead church? Well, Jesus says, I'll come as a thief. You'll be unprepared. Jesus will be against you. It's like a person who falls asleep and doesn't realize that their house is being broken into. And they rob everything right before you. Jesus says, we'll fight against the church and judge it. The idea of the judgment will overtake them. But they're so clueless about their condition that it'll take them by surprise. I can't help but remember Jesus' words. Oh, and it grieves me to say these words, but they're in the Bible, and they're true. And it breaks my heart when I read them. And every time I say them, you know it breaks my heart, because I say it all the time, but it breaks my heart. In Matthew 7, verse 21 and 23, Jesus says, Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but the one who does the will of my Father who is in heaven. And on that day, many will say to me, Lord, Lord, did we not prophesy in your name? Did we not cast out demons in your name and do many works in your name? And then I will declare for them, depart from me. I never knew you. Oh. Horrible words. 
horrible words that I want no one to hear. I don't want anyone to hear those words. Horrible, horrible words. What's the solution for a dead church? Wake up and stay awake. Do whatever you have to do to stay awake. You go on a long drive, you drink coffee and no-dos. You stay awake. Stay awake. Stay awake in church. See, I know which one is you sleep. I, I see you. I see you Eutychuses out there. I know who you are. I see you. Trust me, I see you. Everybody sees you too. You got a little slobber going down your face. I see you. Awake. Come out of your sleep. Awaken. Look at your true nature. Strengthen what is there. Put it back right. You have the root of the gospel. Get back in it. Complete your works. Preach the gospel. Get saved. Invite the Holy Spirit back in. A church with the gospel will always live. Remember, not just say, oh, yeah, yeah, I remember that. You know, we go through things that seem familiar. And you hear, oh, I heard that story before. I know the story. Yeah, come on. No. You should listen and want to hear it. You should be excited when, the, when it's taught. It's an, you should think, yes, I remember. This is what happened. This is how I got saved. And then repent. Adjust your thinking. The church isn't just a building. It's where you and see Jesus. You have him here. He's in your heart. What happens if you're in a dead church? Live out your faithfulness because that's your reward. Be faithful. How does a believer fall asleep spiritually? By living off your reputation rather than Jesus' reputation. By focusing on the ministry instead of who put you in the ministry. By looking at the gifts instead of the gift giver. By ignoring Jesus Christ. Focus your ministry instead of the Messiah. Don't do that. In attention to the gospel and the work of the Spirit in your life. And what is the result? You become unaware of the spiritual threats that are around you. You become spiritually weak and you have no influence. You're ineffective. You start becoming more like the culture around you, heaven forbid. You find yourself disagreeing with Jesus. Oh, no, that's not right, Lord. You become like Peter. No, no, Lord, not so. What's the answer? Jolt yourself awake. I remember a while back, a long time ago, I was really tired. Long ago. And the doctor wanted to give me B12 shots to get me going. Well, gang, this is our B12 shot. This is the B12 shot that we all need. This will give you energy. This will give you life. This will give you pep. This will put a quick back in your step. This will get you going. This is what we need. This is our energy. This is our source. And let the Holy Spirit teach you from this. I mean, he wrote it. He penned it. Come on. This is what we need. Don't think of yourself more highly than you ought. Be sober-minded with the judgment about yourself. Be more aware of what you do and why. Let worship come from your heart, not just from your mouth. Don't worship the Lord with your lips, but in your heart be far from him. Don't do that. Don't do that. So in closing, these letters, he says, listen to each letter. All of Scripture is profitable to someone who has the life of Christ within them. As we draw the service to a close this morning, it may be that some are here who really have never really come to life in Christ. Church attendance is not going to do it, gang. Church attendance will not do it. It will never save you. We don't have membership here, so membership is not going to save you either. It's not going to do it. You are saved solely and only by repenting of your sin and accepting Jesus' sacrifice on the cross. Believing that God raised him from the dead on the third day. You will be saved. Declaring him Lord of your life, you will be saved. And that's what it's about. Your hope can be by, you can't get by in your own character. You can't do it. Only Jesus can make you clean and pure. In Jesus, you will receive a white garment. Only by him. When you accept Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, you're indwelled by the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit comes into your heart. And he, don't grieve the Holy Spirit. Don't quench the Holy Spirit. Don't ignore the Holy Spirit. And then there's another thing called the baptism of the Holy Spirit. When you get power and power to do the things God has called you to do. The baptism of the Holy Spirit. We need that. I don't want that. No, we need that in our lives. I want this church to be alive and constantly be alive. I don't want to be a dead church. I don't want to be a church that has gone by. Well, you know, they were up here and now they're down here. No. I want to be constantly striving and looking for Christ, constantly showing people Jesus Christ, constantly loving people, showing them the love of Jesus Christ. 
And I know that's what you want. I know that's what you want. We don't want to be the church of Sardis. We don't want to be the church of Thyatira. We don't want to be the church of Pergamon. We don't want to be the church of Ephesus. We want to move forward in God's love. But it takes all of us. We all need to be of like mind. We all need to be on the same page. And maybe we need to start back at the beginning. Start at the very... No, mind. You've got to go back to the beginning. We have got to go back to the beginning. Jesus and him crucified. Trusting and resting in what he did on a cross for you. Believing to salvation by him who is only able to give you salvation. You can't get salvation any other way. I think it's so important, church. I think it's so important that we do that. And I think as together, we can do that. There's life here. There's life here. And Jesus has promised us life and life more abundant. And we need to gather that life in through the Holy Spirit and move forward. Don't, let's not get stagnant. Let's not let the moss grow on our feet. Let's move forward. Let's move forward as one. And let's wait. Wait with such patience and hold fast because Jesus is coming again. He is coming again. And every one of us wants to hear those words, well done, good and faithful servant. Enter into the joy of the Lord. Amen? Amen. Father, thank you, Lord, for your word this morning. We are blessed because of you. We are blessed that you have given us life and life more abundantly through Jesus Christ, our Lord. We are blessed, Lord, that you aren't finished with us, that you've given us chance after chance after chance to continue to move forward. You always have a plan for us. There's always hope. Lord, if we're alive and breathing, there's hope, just like we sang earlier, Father God. So thank you, Lord, for all you are. And lay these letters, lay these words be pure and true to us. And may each one of us examine our heart. May each one of us sit before you and say, Lord, search me. Look to me. Look inside. Show me, Lord. Guide me and lead me by your spirit, Father God. Oh, Lord, what a blessing you are. We are so thankful, Lord, for you and all you continue to do. My prayer, Lord, is that anybody here today that is struggling, anybody here today that has maybe turned aside and gone the wrong way, anybody here today who maybe has never even accepted Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior, my prayer is that today would be their day of salvation, that they would come to the knowledge of Jesus, that your spirit would quicken their hearts, and they would believe and they would repent of their sins, and they would ask forgiveness. And Lord, you would forgive them and fill them afresh with your Holy Spirit. I pray, Lord, that you would do that mightily in their lives tonight. That they might know you and come to know you. And that would come alive. We would go from being dead to being alive. We thank you, Lord. And it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Would you stand as we get ready to sing our last song? For those of you who don't know, there was a birthday that snuck by us this week. She didn't really snick, stick by us. We know who she is. Her name happens to be Ruth. And somehow, some way, a cake arrived. What can I say? A cake, you know. Remember, this is Calorie Chapel. We love to eat. Come on. So there's a cake out there, so enjoy that here. But you know what? We need to sing to her. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday, dear Ruthie. Yes. Happy birthday to you. Woo. Yes. All right. Listen, guys, don't forget why we're here. If anyone was touched, if anybody needs any prayer, please, we're here right here. Please, come up for prayer. Don't forget the real reason why we're here, to celebrate Jesus. It's all about the gospel. It's all about him. We do these other things as, because they're fun and we love each other very much. But it's all about Jesus Christ. Never lose sight of that. It's all about Jesus. So if you have any problems, if you need prayer, come forward. If you're hurting, come forward, whatever. Maybe the message touched your heart today and you need some prayer. And we would love to pray with you about it. So don't hesitate. Yeah, the cake will come out. Yeah, there's other things coming out. But that can wait. You always need time for prayer. Please, make time for our Lord if he's touching your heart now. And they're going to sing this special song, and I didn't know they were going to sing it this morning. I forgot about it, but it doesn't matter. I'm going to say it anyhow. <laughs> and now, may the Lord bless you. May the Lord keep you. May the Lord make his face to shine upon you. May the Lord be gracious to you. May the Lord lift up his countenance upon you. May he give you peace. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. And we always say, may it be his per perfect peace. Shalom, shalom.
The Lord bless you and keep you. Make His face shine upon you. Be gracious to you. The Lord turn His face towards you. Lord bless you and keep you, make his face shine upon you, be gracious to you. The Lord turn his face toward you.
Make it a blessed day. If you're around tonight, come on back and join us for family prayer. God bless you all.